Ready? <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today, we are going to make a recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today, we are going to be looking at Beatrix Potter and her incredibly famous and important creation, Peter Rabbit. And we're going to attempt to paint a version of this image. Well, there's a few different ones you'll see in the, this is the outline I did here. Because she did this illustration a number of times, often as gifts for people and obviously for the cover of Peter, The Tales of P Peter Rabbit, her first book, which has sold over 45 million copies, um, making her the single greatest, best-selling children's book author of all time. So, um, and beyond the fact that she did these incredible illustrations, here's another one that uh, the, the Flopsy Bunnies here, I don't think I'm going to get to it today, but that's going to be in the Dropbox uh, she's also an incredible illustrator, very famous also and important for her contributions to science, for her, her illustrations of fungi, better known as mushrooms, although I'm sure someone will correct me of the nuance there. Um, but uh, let's get right into it because I'm, I'm, I'm really fast. I, I just finished watching the movie Miss Potter starring Renee Zellwinger and Ewan McGregor. Great, uh, very simple movie, and um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I got lots of stuff to talk about. <laughs> so let's get into it. The This is the plan of attack. We're going to get the image onto the canvas. I'll show you how to do that, where to find that. Then we're going to stain it. We're going to talk a little bit about Beatrix Potter's biography. Then we're... Ooh, do we need to do an under... Maybe we... Well, let's see. I'll think about it as we go. We're going to do a background, foreground, background. I mean, ideally, we'll finish in less than four hours because I want to make this one of the simpler paintings for people, especially younger people or people who are just starting out to paint. So I want to try to keep it relatively simple. So let's, let's go for three hours. Again, how long I talk about it is a whole other thing. Um... Of course, if you're watching the, the channel for the first time, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, comment on videos, comment on the live stream, all those things help. And if you want to support the channel with a small donation, you can use PayPal, Super Chat, send me an email or e-transfer. My email is in the description below. It's on the Facebook group and my website. Everything is down below if you want to help keep this show on the road. Okay, so let's go to our first step here. So the first step is getting an image on the canvas for us to paint. So I've already created an image for you. Um, this is my composite drawing based on a number of other of, of images. This is on the cover of one of, of, of one of the editions of the books. Here's another one. Uh, that was on the cover of a book. This is one of the earliest, and it's based on one of the earliest sketches from her uh, notebooks and letters. And we'll talk about the whole, the, the how the Harry Potter story was began, I guess. Um, and then this is for from a, a different later edition. So there's lots of material to go from but anyway this is the image that you can download and I'll show you where to find that um, you'll see in fact just a quick plug for the Facebook group you'll see every episode I do a little biography based on the research that I've done and um, you can see here 17 new requests for today well that's going to take us right over 1,000 members of our Facebook group that's incredible in just over a year it's grown so fast that's awesome uh, but anyway, here's the Dropbox folder. You'll see the, the link in the description below for the Dropbox. You want to scroll down here. You'll well, Actually, at the very top are the resources for to get started with painting. The next, um, uh, there's more than 30, about 50 folders here that begin with a letter. Those are our, our easiest 
paintings, and you'll see today's is, is filed along with them. But then there's another 150 folders down here full of, of more complex images if you feel a little bit more adventuresome. Uh, anyway, let's click in here. You'll see that there is... How many files in here? We've got two, four, six, eight, nine. So there are four images um, variants of the painting we're going to do today along with two versions of the outline that I did which you can download for free and then the other one here of the flopsy bunnies and so that's that image plus the the outline so the difference in the outlines one's a JPEG one's a PDF whatever is easier for you to print on your printer at home so let's uh, let's get that whole process started now obviously you could learn to draw and draw this all out by eye um, but um, if you don't know how to draw you can take my free drawing course here on YouTube you don't have to pay or sign up for anything it's all down below there's 45 episodes there's a couple hundred thousand views so it's very popular but I get lots of great comments about it every every episode or every day um, and so you could sketch this whole thing out. But uh, I just want to focus on painting in these classes. So uh, you can download that uh, PDF or JPEG that I have on the Dropbox folder. I printed it out on my inkjet printer here at home, a regular piece of paper. And before I, I put this on here, I'm going to put it, apply it to a 9 by 12 sized canvas panel or canvas board. You can buy these, this exact one from Amazon. The link is below. I like these. They, they, you buy like 20 of them for 50 bucks. So there's about two and a half dollars each or something. Uh, they are superior to the ones you get for only one dollar at the dollar store. Um, and you can buy them for like five dollars at Opus or Michaels or De Sears or various other art supply stores. I like these. Um, they're certainly cheaper and I think they're better than the ones you buy for five dollars. I wouldn't spend five dollars on a canvas board. Um, anyway, then I, I get it out of the plastic, I sand it lightly, then I apply a white acrylic gesso over the surface, let that dry overnight, and then sand it again with just like a 220 grit sandpaper. You know, I just take a old piece of 2x4, wrap it around, staple it, and that makes a great little sanding block as well. So, let's put... Where do I want to put this? I might, well, I guess it's basically in the middle. I was going to say I might raise it up a little bit higher, but I think that's probably good. Okay, so I've taped that in the middle. Now the next step is I'm going to use carbon transfer paper, or actually I'm using graphite transfer paper that's just in the carbon transfer paper folder here, but it does exactly the same thing, different material, that's almost identical and if you're old enough to remember using a credit card when before uh, the internet this carbon paper is how they made an impression of your credit card back in the day All right so once I put that down there and you'll see one side is a little bit darker and you can see I've, I've used this many many times so it's not just like one and done you can use it over and over and one side's gray, right? We want the, the darker side facing down. You may perhaps find you can only get double-sided carbon paper. Nothing wrong with that. That just means you don't have to worry about whether you put it down in the right side or not. Um, but you will get an image on the back side of your template. And again, not such a bad, bad uh, deal. Now, again, I'm going to simplify all this. I'm not even going to draw those lines, like the lighter lines on his face and hair and all that kind of stuff, because we're going to paint over all of that. <clears throat> so the purpose here is just to help us get an image onto the canvas that we can then use to guide us through the painting process to help with the composition and we've got the background 
around here. I'm not so sure how much I want to do there. This shadow. We'll see. You can see that I've used this carbon paper many times, so it's less um, it's less dense of lines. So I'm just actually just gonna go back over some of these. I just shifted the carbon paper over, hoping that maybe that will will get a little bit darker lines. Okay, that's better. Good enough. You can see I didn't do any of those lines in the background. It's not, I don't think that's any of that's gonna be, be helpful. So, oh, there's Pascal in the chat and Lisa and Sarah says, good morning from Australia. Looking forward to this one, awesome. Australia came very close to winning the Women's World Cup of Soccer, or football, as, as everybody else on Earth calls it. Um, I was watching, cheering for Australia. That was my team. That would have been awesome if Australia had won the World Cup on home, uh, home turf, but uh, I guess it wasn't in the cards, hey? But still, quite an achievement. Okay, so I got my image on here. Let's move to the next step. And there's Goodman in the chat as well saying hello. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, next step. Now that we've got our image roughly traced out onto the canvas, let's stain it with a little bit of color. Now you don't have to do this. But I like doing it, I encourage people to do it, or just, just to think about it, or even just to watch what happens, and then decide for yourself if you want to do it or not. You don't have to. I think it's um, uh, a technique that came down to us from, was really popularized by the Renaissance artists like Leonardo da Vinci, and you know, if it's good enough for Leonardo, mm, good enough for me. That's my attitude, right? Having said that, lots of Impressionist painters did not do this. Um, so, and it's certainly f probably more so than ever, less popular than it ever was. But I still, I'm always, I, the reason I continue to do this, even on artworks like today's that don't feature an imprimatura, um, I think it's a good habit, or at least uh, something to, to think about as you're working. So let's just briefly talk about the palette that I'm going about to use here. I'm going to use essentially seven tubes of paint. I know it says eight at the top, but we'll get to that in a second. Essentially, this palette is called a split primary palette, which means we take the so-called three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, and we split each of them in half into their warm and cool colors. So we have two yellows, two reds, two blues, each one being warm or cool. And then we're going to add white to some of these colors. And if we want to paint with black, then we can mix our own black. Now, I have a black tube of paint that I've had for, you know, three years since we started doing these. And it's still mostly full because the magic of this system is we can make our own black. So we can make about 95% of all the colors that the human eye can see good enough, I think, right? And certainly much cheaper than buying all sorts of different colors from these various different brands. So this is the paint that I'm about to use here. Uh, that's what it looks like when you buy it in the store when it actually has paint in it, but it's I've squeezed it out into jars. So when I've when I after I've squeezed all the paint out and then there's that little bit left, rather than just tossing it in the garbage, I cut it open and then I use a little spatula to scoop out the extra paint and it goes in here. And you can see some of these jars are so full of paint, like that yellow. That's eight or no, 12 tubes of paint 
um, that I otherwise would have thrown out, and and instead, there's probably enough for two or three extra tubes. So just my little recommendation there to strongly consider um, rescuing the last little bits of paint in your in your tubes. Good man says, I have a question. Can I ask? Of course you can ask. I can't guarantee I'll answer it, but I'll do my best. So here's the paint. This I'm about to use an Azo Yellow Deep as my Imprimatura priming layer. Uh, it's a warm yellow, but of course, as I said, you could use a cool red, you could use a cool blue, a warm, I mean, you could use all sorts of colors. You could use polka dots, stripes. I encourage you to consider playing around with it. Some people do texture, incorporate texture as part of the Aim Prima Tour. There's Mandy P uh, from Brisbane. Oh, wow, look at this. We're, we're all, the, all the folks down south tonight. Uh, down under. Okay, sorry, that's my that's my horrible uh, accent. <laughs> okay, here's uh, a golden paint. You could use golden. So let's say a tube of golden paint like this might cost you about $30. This would cost you about $12. This is going to be better quality. But if you're just starting out, you will not notice the difference in quality. And especially if you can learn how to use cheaper paint and do good job with it, you may even not even need to use ever good paint because you can use that material really well. Um, so Golden works really great, just expensive. Liquitex is awesome. Windsor & Newton, Artist Loft for Michael's Art Supply Chain, Buzz, Holbein, Dyler Rowney, Fevacryl, Novacolor, Chromacolor. But I'm not the biggest fan of Museum Color nor Peebo. Peebo is a very well-known brand, but like Museum Color, one of the things they do is they add, I think, just a little bit too much titanium white as a as a filler to try to make the color look a little bit more opaque. And the problem with that is it makes it impossible to make a black. And you, even with all the other colors I use, except perhaps the golden, you won't get a perfect black. You're going to get a near black, and near black is generally good enough. And if you do need black, well, grab your black paint and use that uh, instead. But black is a very intense color, just like white. It's very dominating, and you want to be careful where you use it and how much of it you use, right? It's sort of, um, you should think of like black paint as like truffle oil or caviar or something like you want to be you know, it's you, you don't need a lot for it. It has a you know strong flavor, I guess. All right. Okay, so let's apply some paint on the palette there. Um, Goodman says, uh, my question is that I I can make sketch for the image, then color it with water coloring pen. Or do I need colors and brush to make layers? Uh, question is, can I make a sketch for the image then color it with watercolor pen? Watercoloring pen. I'm not not sure I understand the question, Goodman. Um, can I can I make sketch for the image then color? Um, I think, I think, are you saying, can I draw on a piece of paper and then color it with water coloring pens? Um, well, okay. Um, uh, yeah, well, I mean, you could certainly do, use any material in any way that you want. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do anything as an artist because that's wrong. You can do whatever you want. Um, obviously, you're going to get different results than I'm going to get if you use different materials and techniques. But that's okay, too. That could be a really cool discovery. Uh, um, goodness, says, I mean, color pen, not with wood, but the other type. Um... Yeah, you could use uh, colored pens, colored pencils. You could use markers, crayons. Uh, you could use 
um, spray paint. You could use airbrush. Obviously, you're you know you would get again a different result if you if you used pens. Um, uh, said my English is not good, but I'm tr you're, I'm trying my best to describe. I totally appreciate that. I'm sure uh, your English is better than whatever other language. <laughs> Uh, you might be uh, might want to use better better than mine my version of whatever it might be <laughs> um, that's certainly true um, my recommendation is if you want to use a a specific material would be to do something like watch some videos of people using that material and see if that material appeals to you or um you know just like we're doing here like these are classes intended for people to to really learn how to use acrylic paint um and so i'm teaching people how to use acrylic paint by by paint recreating these famous paintings throughout history but um You should, uh, you can certainly take the templates that I've created and use them to, you could, you could print them out and just use coloring pencils and color them in if you like. Um, our coloring markers. But, you know, as you since you bring it up like can't there are there are people who will tell you you cannot do certain things or you cannot use certain materials and i don't know i don't i and i when i i teach i always hear horrible stories about teachers who are really discouraging i think if you want to use a material you should use it even if, and maybe even especially if no one's ever used it before. I think that sounds, that that is exciting to kind of break new ground and to try to use a material in an unconventional manner. I'm all for it. As before I used only pencil for drawing and I make shading and layers with just only pencil, so painting is new for me. Totally. Um... And that's one reason why people like to use watercolor, because watercolor is relatively inexpensive and easy to get your hands on. I, as a, you may have heard me say many times before, I think watercolor is really the most difficult art medium to use uh, because... Um, it's the most difficult art medium to use because it's very unforgiving. If you make a mistake with watercolor, you have to figure out how to make it work. You can't just sort of paint over it. Well, you could, again, you can use the material any way you want. But the thing with watercolor is if you paint white over a mistake, often it draws more attention to itself than if you had just left it alone. Now, if your goal is to like paint on watercolor and then scan it into the computer or something like that, well, then it doesn't really matter what the original looked like. But if you intend to, to produce an image that you want to keep or hang on the wall, then that's why I like acrylic paint. And acrylic paint is generally one of the less expensive art materials. Uh, you can generally find versions. That's why I show lots of different makes of paint, because you can you can find relatively cheap paints. Now, sometimes they're too cheap. Like the ones that they sell at the dollar store here in Canada and the United States are dubious for sure. But even just using ink, I mean, hey, for the long, longest time in human history, people would use berries and and 
leaves and flowers and tea and coffee and things from uh, wine and all that kind of stuff to stain uh, canvases. So, you know, you can use really anything. Uh, Sandish says, lots of love from Nepal. Awesome. Look at how diverse the audience is today. People from all over the world. Wow. Uh, Goodman posted some drawings in the group. I'll take a look. Um, Goodman says, so painting is better and easier more than pencil. Ooh, I don't know. That's, uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I would... Ooh. Is paint, you know, you if you ask a hundred different artists whether what is easier, painting or drawing, I think you would get a hundred different answers, and no one would agree. I think if you ask a, someone who draws all the time, they would probably say, "Oh yeah, drawing is so easy. Painting, oh, don't get me started. That's the most complicated thing on earth." And then you talk to somebody who paints all day, you say. Oh, painting is so easy. I could teach you to paint in an hour, but drawing, oh my goodness, that's so complex because, you know, with paint, you can kind of hide your mistakes and you can kind of fudge things. You can use color in in ways that you can't do as well or as easily with pencils. And um, versus like pencil, it's just like, you just you're putting lines on the page sometimes where they don't really exist and that can be really difficult so yeah i don't i mean those are those are all great questions goodman <laughs> it's uh you, you've asked some some good big questions there i like that that's awesome okay i think let's just look at the ah at these images here and I just want to think about what color I want to use for the background. Now, you might say, well, pfft, you just painted a yellow background, Michael. What are you talking about? Okay, well, hold on. I'm, I'm going to paint a color over top of this yellow. And then you're like, well, pfft, well, what's the point of then painting a yellow if you're going to paint right over top of it? Well, that's what this concept of the imprimatura is. Is that we apply a, a color that um, kind of infuses the painting with um well there's all sorts of reasons one of which i really like is that this yellow is going to come through in some small way all the way through the painting to the very end um and maybe we don't see this yellow and you, you show it to somebody after it's like i don't where's oh i can see a little bit on the side but i don't really see it in the front but they are seeing it they're just not aware of it because of the way that the light penetrates through the surfaces um, I like it because it gives the painting a kind of a warm yellow glow afterwards. And I love color and I like that the sunset kind of feeling. It's a nice warm kind of quality. Um, but uh, it also helps kind of create a smoother surface because then any more of the texture of the canvas is getting filled in with the texture of with the, the paint. Anyway, there's that one, that one, that one, and that one. Now, I think what I'm going to do is paint. Use I'm I'm going to use I think the the colors from this and kind of combine it with that so that I get a little bit of a halo or it's kind of the image is kind of fades out onto the edges here. So, to do that and I like this slightly peachy color that we see here like uh, this one's got a little bit more of a bluish quality I like this peachy one so let's Use a rag that uh... so I'm just wiping off some of that excess paint. In fact, let me I should blow dry that. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly blow dry this.
Although I did just have a bit of a brainwave. What if I painted the whole thing and then just p faked out the paper around the edge? Hmm. You know what? I'm going to go this way, but I, I, it does... Or... Yeah, let's do it the way that I was planning on doing it. And then if I do do the Flopsy Bunny, I'll do it the opposite way. I know I'm being very vague and... <laughs> like, I don't... Um, yeah, it's easier just to do it and then explain and then show you in a different episode. So, okay, so I'm taking my white. Took a little bit of red. Wow, it's more than I was, should have put on there. You can see how quickly a color changes when or especially white changes when we add color to it so that's a little bit too that's better it's still it goes to show how dominant a color can be when it comes to white okay now if i just paint this white right over top of this surface now it's going to hide everything that was there so and it's like well then what's the point of doing all of the the um, the pencil lines here right so i'm gonna i added some acrylic matte medium in fact let's put even more Not sure how well that shows up on camera, but I think it's just transparent enough. So what I'm doing is I see little areas where a bit of that yellow is still poking through. So I'm just trying to brush that in so it gets covered up. Okay, I think that looks pretty good. 
I think it might be, it's going to be a little bit peachier than the original, but that's okay. In fact, that reminds me more of the um, Peter Rabbit books I had as a kid. Just that, because sometimes that, um, that little bit of a patina, you know, can make something look older, like as if it's uh, aged, you know, it's weathered. So... I kind of like that. Certainly, like as I said, more peachy, more red than the image there on the left. But you know, another example of a happy accident, as Bob Ross used to say, right? Oh, uh, goodness, this, uh, I'm just curious about drawing. Sorry if I'm bothering you with my questions. You're not bothering me at all. You're you're making uh, for uh, interesting conversation, and you're keeping me company. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have from you or anybody else who has uh, tuned in. Otherwise, this would be very lonely. <laughs> I depend on you guys to to keep me uh, company. Okay, that looks, I'm really excited with that surface. So now I'm gonna blow dry it and it's just kind of, and I think you'll probably see those pencil lines reappear too. Okay, so now there's probably still wet paint along those edges. That's totally fine. <laughs> Goodness says, thanks for that. It's exciting here watching and making conversation with you. That makes me happy to hear. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, maybe while this dries, let's... Move on. So while we let this canvas dry, let's talk a little bit about who Beatrix Potter was and how she became the best-selling children's book author of all time. Still to this day, the books that she created, all 23 of them, are uh, continue to be enjoyed by generation after generation after generation. So let's um, let's let's start right at the beginning here. So uh, Helen Beatrix Potter was born in 1866 in London, England, and dies in 1943 in the north of England. So she lives to age 77 and lives a long, happy, very productive life and um, of with a few ups and downs for sure. So let's I want to show you just kind of briefly. Here's the city of London and just as we'll zoom all the way out in case people don't know where London is. <laughs> so here's. There's Europe, here's England, there's Scotland, Ireland here, uh, Wales on the left. So let's zoom in here. Oops, no, I don't want to, okay. So London is obviously a huge town, town, city. <laughs> um, 
but um, uh, Helen Beatrix Potter is born right here, kind of in the interest, some people would say Hammersmith or Kensington, Chelsea, you know, there's uh, all of these districts here, but this is the actual place uh, where she was born. Now, um, the thing is, is that her house was destroyed in the bombing of uh, of uh, of London by the Nazis during World War II. So this is the original location of where she um, was born in this house right here on the corner. Um, I thought there was a plaque somewhere there. Let's just see if we could find the plaque. Hmm. Maybe... Uh, anyway, it, that's where <laughs> she's originally born. And um, she's born into a, a relatively wealthy family. And um, that that provided her was had sort of its pluses and minuses for her um, one of which is because she was born into a wealthy family unlike most women of her time um, she had um, she was able to get an education <laughs> to be quite frank um, uh, a lot of women you know unfortunately up until relatively recently had very few opportunities and uh, because she was from a wealthier family, she had what were called governesses, basically nannies, who would um, be with her, you know, throughout the day, teaching her things. Most of the education, of course, was uh, intended to groom her into becoming a good housewife. Um, so lots of things like how to, you know... Um, entertain um, high other high society people keeping a house tidy and neat she probably didn't learn how to do too much of the nitty-gritty because she was being from a wealthy family that they would have she would have eventually inherited money and had her own set of um, of help but um, still she would have learned you know a lot of these very traditional feminine female um, uh, roles, uh, and and so that I, I suppose was was great because other more you know poorer women uh, kind you know weren't might have gone to some sort of girls' school, but even then the, the opportunities were very limited. So um, that was a plus. She, I think she says somewhere. Oh no! It's in one of these tabs that I have here. She did. Um, she she does say that she was grateful that she never actually went to school because she felt that that would have eliminated the originality that was inside of her, and that she had a much more free experience. Learning um, allowed her imagination to really thrive. And again, some people would say maybe you know she had too much. Uh, of uh, opportunity for her imagination to run wild. I mean, obviously the we see the results her becoming internationally famous and um, and making huge contributions to art and culture and uh, preservation of natural lands, which we'll get into. Um, but uh, anyway, so she she has. Um, um, these these various different people throughout her life teaching her um, about uh, obviously again these traditional female um, uh, roles but also she takes a great interest in the natural environment in animals and in plants and from a very early age she starts she's drawing the things around her you know she often spends large amounts of time in the north of of England in what is now known as the Lake District and so that this Lake District is at the very north uh, well not, not the very very north but very close to the uh, the to Scotland here in northern England northwest uh, Scotland so north of Liverpool and Manchester and so she would go up there with her family 
in the summer or during the fall or spring and and it was a you know there they had a, a small estate up there that you could explore and so just lots of time where as you know perhaps boys would have been in school you know studying and learning all these different things she's out in the world with her various different uh, private tutors teaching her things directly from nature so that so she's she's now so she starts like picking flowers picking plants bugs taking them back to the house and drawing them in her sketchbooks and she gets better and better and better and better at that um, largely being self-taught and she starts making up stories based on all of these things um, and um, well let's get to the stories in a, in a moment so you could see like 1881 so where's She's born in uh, 1866. So by like age 15, she's doing like pretty serious studies of the the, the flora and fauna in um, in these various different locations in London and Northern England. Uh, so much so that she really starts um, uh, taking an interest in science and and her illustrations of various different mushrooms, fungi. Um, are still used today in natural history textbooks. They're used by scientists to study, especially uh, mushrooms from her time and seeing if they've evolved or changed um, as throughout the passage of time. So there's there are um, uh, many people who see her contributions to uh, uh, what is what's the name mycology. They see her contributions to mycology as being just as important as her contributions to culture, right? And I don't have it anymore, but there was a really cool book uh, I had from the library for, oh, on all the scans around my laptop upstairs. Anyway, of all of the, the drawings that she did besides the, her, you know, Peter Rabbit, etc., which made her way, way more famous. And... If you get a chance to, to, to look at that book, uh, oh, let me see. Um, let's see if we can. This is it here. I'm sure you could get this book from your local library. But, you know, here's some of the salamanders or newts that she saw. You know, these are, these are exceptional illustrations. So had she not become known for her, um, for things like Peter Rabbit, she would have been probably known as, as one of the great scientific illustrators of her time or our time of all time. <laughs> so I, again, I, it's, uh, uh, I, I just find that absolutely remarkable. So let's continue down here. I think I want to show reject all those cookies okay so what i have here on this on the screen here is this legendary picture letter they call it which is essentially the the beginning where this all begins where we have a letter that she wrote to a young boy noel who was the five-year-old uh, son of one of her former governesses right so her, after her nanny moves on, uh, her nanny has a child of her own, and uh, Beatrix Potter kept in touch with her former nanny and um, wrote letters back and forth, right? This is before emails and text messages and everything. So wrote letters, and um, one of these letters was intended to be sort of a little simple story that 
the that her friend could read to her son right so i think it says here i don't know what to write to you um but i think i'll tell you a little it's like i think i'll tell you a little story about um four little rabbits there's flopsy mopsy cottontail and peter and so what the it begins here because it was a piece of paper folded in half right so you have you know let's say that's the uh, the first page of the book right and then it opens up we have to choose three and four so this being the front cover that's why it's on the right hand side there right so um the story begins it's a very simple story here's page two and three of the um of the rabbits and they, they're growing out into the field and picking berries uh, blackberries and then they're getting chased by mr mcgregor the farmer next door and in this story we don't see the farmer mcgregor at all and then they come home and um mom makes um a uh, blackberries for bread milk and blackberries for supper so very simple story and this begins a number of letters that she's writing to her friend. Let, I should get, uh, what's the, the actual story? Uh, Annie Moore. So, that, so Annie Moore was the, the woman, her former governess, that um, she was writing stories. And um, after you know a dozen or so of these letters arrive at her friend annie's place and she's reading to her children she's like you know beatrix these stories that you're sending me just these little uh, stories as in, in letters have you ever thought of like putting them together into a book because you know my kids love them like they they keep them and they ask me every night to read them and you know these pages are getting folded and dog-eared and torn and you know like what are we going to do when they're they all fall apart like I'd, I'd love to be able to share them with other kids and when my kids outgrow them but i don't want to let them you know have these old letters they're precious to me so the wheels start kind of moving and again at this time um beatrix potter is most interested in drawing mushrooms and plants and really st and she not only was she drawing them but she even came up with various different theories about fungi and and how they grow and and the networks that they create of which were and so not only that i think it probably has a little bit of mention in here she she wrote a a, a thesis and of course, back in the day, women weren't allowed to into the building to present their own papers before the the old bearded white guys who sat in judgment. So she had an, a, a man go in and read the paper for on her behalf. Of course, it was it was ridiculed and dismissed. Although decades later, the the theories that she proposed turned out to be true. <laughs> right? So I, I, this is she's. A, a trailblazer in many different uh, respects here but anyway this is she's writing these letters featuring this this uh, uh, newly minted character Peter Rabbit or, or based on a former bunny of her own called Peter Piper that was one of her bunnies uh, because she lived on you know in, again in london and in northern england where she had these big properties so she had all these animals kind of coming in and out of the house or in the garden she would have some of them on leashes some of them would run away there are stories of her uh, having mice in the house and she kind of trained them when she would wave her little handkerchief around the mice would come out and she could pick them up and then put them into their cage at night i mean I wish I could do that with the mice I have in my, in my studio here. Um, but uh, so she's and you know, it's interesting. The movie that was made about her. Um, here's uh, Miss Potter starring Renee Zellwinger. 
it has all these instances and I was trying to find out how real or how accurate this was. Um, this movie, by the way, is on Amazon Prime if you want to watch it. But um, there are all these instances where she's sort of talking to her sketches and they kind of come alive and, and act things out. I mean, obviously, I don't think her sketches actually came alive and that she was hallucinating. There, Renee Zellwinger kind of quirkily talks to her sketchbook and calls them her friends like she you know she goes over to visit publishers to present her her ideas for her book and she forgets them on the table and then they're like oh miss potter your your sketches have you forgotten something she's like oh yes my friends okay come on guys let's go you got my friends with me right it's like a little silly um and the movie's not really geared towards children either so it kind of makes her seem a little bit kooky which again I, I wasn't able to verify or not. It's possible that she was, you know, very... Well, I mean, she obviously was very imaginative, but I don't know how um, eccentric she really was. But I, I think that's a it's a great movie. It really captures the story of her life quite well. Um, but where do I want to pick up here? So she... she her, her, uh, her old friend encourages her to put this together as a book, so she then goes around with her sketches and uh, because actually her friend sent her all those letters back again so that she could kind of remember what those stories were and, and redraw them so she redraws them into like a, um, a book template and she goes around to various different publishers um, as far as I know there were six of them that she visited and all of them rejected her her proposal and they were just like nobody wants this um, uh, some of her things that she was adamant on she wanted the book to be published in black and white and she wanted it to be small so that little kids could afford them and hold them in their own hands that was and and the publishers many of them were like this is great we could publish them it's we, we're going to do it full color and it's going to cost you know let's say like forty dollars a book and she's like no i appreciate that but it has to be inexpensive because I want it to be for little kids and not like a collector's item that sits on a bookshelf and the parents don't ever want to take it down because they're afraid of it getting like wrecked. This has got to be a book that little kids can afford or their parents can buy it for their, their children. And if let's say they color in it or tear pages out, it's not the end of the world. And, you know, we think about that now as being like, yeah, obviously anyone who's, I have a four year old daughter and any book that comes into this house is, you know, torn and beat up and drawn on within a day, right? Um, so that to me is like, that's very perceptive that she was already make, making that, that because she might have been one of the first persons to, to literally say, what, how can we make books that are most appropriate for children, that are geared towards children? Another thing that was really kind of groundbreaking about these stories is again think about she wrote the origin of peter rabbit was of um, her attempts to write stories for her friend's children or her nanny's children right so she had a very specific audience in mind a little five-year-old boy that she's writing those stories to so the language is very simple the stories are very simple the illustrations are very simple. Um, there's, in fact, one of the, there's a story of a um, a friend of hers that that took her because she was having difficulty selling her book. Was like, well, why don't we, you know, I'll, I'll put a little bit of uh, poetic spin on your text, and I'll put them into these like rhyming couplets, and and uh, and then that might help them sell. Well, eventually, when she did find a pub, well. Well, okay, so when she eventually did find a publisher, the one stipulation is we want to use your language because we like how, you know, how straightforward it is. Um, anyway, so she she's continually rejected by these publishers. So she decides in 1901 to self-publish uh, this book, uh, The Tale of Peter Rabbit. And it's in, uh, let me see, I wonder if there's... So the, the, the original, I wonder if there's, oh, 
here we are. So this is the first edition. That's what it looked like. The very simple version that she self-published herself. Um, and it was larger. It had more illustrations than the eventual pub the first edition in, in 1902 when she had it published through um, Frederick Warren and Co. And the reason why it was they removed some illustrations was is to make it more affordable which was along the lines of what Beatrix Potter wanted so by printing less uh, illustrations and this time they did want them in, in color uh, but they found a way to do it that was much cheaper than she had originally thought they would be uh, so the original that original run of um, of uh, Peter Rabbit the the ones that she self published that those didn't immediately sell, but when these ones came out the following year, they they started to, to sell actually quite well, and they they did print after print after print, and it became a huge seller for them. Obviously, it's still on sale 120 years later, right? Uh, but. Uh, certainly exceeded her own wildest expectations of what that book could achieve. Um, kind of the, the, this movie, Miss Potter centers on, is really about the, the, that, the, the publication of her first book and then what happens afterwards. So essentially the, the, the publisher, um, Frederick Warren and Co. She she ends up falling in love with her editor, and they uh, he's he really is the one that really uh, finally of all the people that she had interacted with really believed in her, supported her, helped get the first few editions off, and and encouraged her to write more of which she did, and then he proposes to her. Her parents were mortified that this man from a middle class blue well not even blue collars like like middle class family it was doing pretty well family of book publishers her family being from a very wealthy um uh uh stock uh were mortified that she was planning on marrying this this man from a lower class and did everything in their power to prevent that marriage from taking place um and they kind of came up with this stipulation that, okay, how about let's let's give you three months, let's and you know well you can have your you can be engaged but we don't want you to tell anybody about this engagement. We're, we'll all go away to the north of England to our property, and we'll spend the summer up there. And if when you come back to London and you see uh your uh, the, the um what was his name uh norman so when it, when you come back and if norman uh warren is still interested in marrying you and you're still interested in marrying him then we'll consent to that marriage and so they go away for the summer and tragically, like, I mean, right out of a Hollywood movie, while she's away, he um, passes away quite suddenly from leukemia. And, um, you know, this is back in the day where people didn't really even know what that was. And so there certainly wasn't any treatment. Or, I mean, there's still no cure. Uh, but it, you know, one day he's just kind of coughing but and kind of weak and the next day he's gone he's dead so tragedy she races back but she missed um she wasn't able to be there before he died and so she's completely distraught over the death of her fiance and one of the so she fairly soon after uh, uh, takes the money that she has made from these Peter Rabbit books and some of the other um, books that she had written afterwards. And because he died only, I think, three months after uh, he originally proposed to her. 
and all, all of this is happening very quick. Like this book comes out in 1902, 1903. Um, uh, when does he pass away? Nineteen oh five, they become unofficially engaged, and then he passes away. You know that August, so I think it's like in May they become engaged, and then by August he's dead. So she then moves up to. She uses some of the the money that she's made, and buys property up there in northern England. Right, this what is now the hilltop. Beatrix Potter House. Here. Beautiful, beautiful location. We'll just see, here's like lots of pictures. Uh, this is also a historic monument, and you you can go tour it. There's here's the website. All again, all these links, everything I show you is always links in the description. But you can tour her home. It's, it's basically been preserved exactly the way it was when she passed away. They have, um, you know, all sorts of things. Like this is the little dollhouse that she had. All the collections. It was even sort of open as a semi-official museum while she was alive, because towards the end of her life, you know, she's one of the most successful authors on the planet, and you have lots of little kids, other authors wanting to come visit her. So she used this house uh, as her her studio and where she would entertain guests and, and friends, etc. Uh, one of the things she does when she moves up there um, in 1900, late 1905, 1906, is uh, about seven years later, six years later, she marries another fellow, William Hellis. Uh, Hellis? Hellis, I'm trying to remember how they pronounced it. Um, uh, and... Um, together they live in that house and then the nearby castle cottage. And so they accumulated all of this territory because her books, again, let's just look here at the, the list of best-selling books of all time here. Here you have books over a hundred million copies that have sold. Okay. So here's Beatrix Potter, more than Jonathan oh, Livingston. See, that's not really a kids' book, is it? Uh, the Very Hungry Caterpillar. You see all these kind of these books that um, are children's literature. There was more of them in this list. Um, you know, there are some other books that have sold more, like Charlotte's Web, but many of these other books, like Watership Down, Anna Green Gables, Heidi, Catcher in the Rye, Harry Potter, obviously has sold lots of books here, but most of those books, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, are kind of like young adult fiction, in which there's, you know, um, one illustration for every dozen pages or something, right? Um, where the Peter Rabbit books, you have a, an illustration and maybe one sentence or less per drawing, right? So they're much, much of more of like children's books. And that's why she is by far the, the best-selling children's book author of all time. Um, what else do I want to mention here? Let me see. Let's see. Oh, so another, I guess one thing that I wanted to highlight here is the fact that this image that we're about to paint today, she used many, many times over and over and over again. And this image here, you can see this is not the original one that was used on the cover of a book, but it was done as a gift and given away. Um, to friends, and so I, what I suspect, and you can see, look at this one. It's not even the official one. It sold for nearly thirty thousand dollars. And oops, forgot to turn, plug that in. 
Um, so the um, okay, this is overheating. Um, so what I suspect happened here is that th obviously this is the cover for the Tales of Peter Rabbit that she because it became such a, a good highly you know because it became such a successful book and sold so many copies what she probably got into the habit of doing is drawing this image over and over but either by hand or using a very similar process that we've used here with carbon paper to do our transfers onto canvas so that she would do many many of these and then sign them and give them away um, sometimes to little kids to friends as gifts um, and also she would give them away to charity as a fundraiser so she would draw them and say you can auction this off so that's why one of the reasons because there are literally thousands of versions of this of today's image that i found online so i think that it was probably part of her her um, it's almost like a signature, right? Like a stamp that she could do very quickly, color in very quickly, and then uh, and give them away. Uh, as is, many authors have that kind of thing too. If you see the way they sign books, they might do the same quick little drawing of something uh, along with their their signature below. So. Anyway, highly recommend this movie, Miss Potter. It's it's not a it's a very simple movie. It's not um, uh, Oppenheimer or anything. It's but I kind of like movies that are very simple, straightforward. The drama is very very low, and and I don't really like stressful um, movies. But highly recommend. That. I think it tells the story in a, in a good way. It's a little obviously always everything a little bit overly simplified. Um, one of the things that's interesting is um, some of the the biggest fans of Beatrix Potter and and Peter Rabbit are Japanese people. Apparently, I don't know if it was here on Wikipedia, but something like eighty percent of Japanese children alive today recognize Peter Rabbit. I don't know if you would get twenty percent of. North American audiences today would know who Peter Rabbit is. I could be wrong. I haven't started reading Peter Rabbit to my daughter yet, but I, um, I just, I'm, I'm not sure how Peter Rabbit became such a hugely popular. Um, oh yeah, right here. The eighty percent of the population, the Japanese population, has heard of Peter Rabbit. I, I mean, that's hard to believe. Oh, there we are. Here's the the link I didn't even see that why 80% of the population Japanese population loves Beatrix Potter um, anyway here's the article it apparently explains why it's so um, so popular maybe someone wants to read that article and give us a summary in the in the chat there I just put that in the chat. Oh my goodness, look at all these comments. Uh, Eamon says, Hi, I really love your work so much. I have a side question. So I draw and paint in a good level, but it always has to be either a picture or from life. Uh, and I really hope to be able to paint for my imagination, but I can't. And this is making me feel that I'm less of an artist. Oh my goodness, that's terrible. I don't want you to feel that way. Um, Pascal offers some great thoughts about um, doing some drawing, working on compositions to help you. Well, I'm, I'm sure the conversation looks like it goes on and on, but um, I think, you know, today's artist is a perfect artist for you to, to think about when you're thinking about um, using your imagination. 
because especially like the, the image we're looking at today, this image of a rabbit actually looks a lot more like rabbits that we're used to. Now, obviously, we don't often see rabbits running around and, and blue jackets and stuff. But the original uh, Peter Rabbit drawings are, are look more like rabbits than, than, let's say, children's illustrators today would do. Right? Or if you think of like Bugs Bunny, it looks kind of like a rabbit, but not really. Whereas her illustrations are very much like she drew a rabbit and then just drew a jacket on the rabbit. And um, so she's not, she's using her imagination, but it's all based on things that she saw and drew. And, you know, when you say that I have, I can draw from life and I can draw from, um, from pictures and photographs, but I have a hard time just drawing things from my, my, my imagination. I'd say I'm probably the same way for sure. Like if somebody just says, uh, draw, like, I mean, how many times has this happened in my life? Someone is like, oh, you're an artist. Draw something, draw something for me right now, right now, draw, draw something. I'm like, uh, pfft. I, what like what am I gonna oh just, I don't know draw a dinosaur flying a spaceship like I, I I wouldn't have any idea how to start that sketch off the top of my head I mean now I've been drawing for decades now I would, would be able to do it but that kind of thing does not interest me at all I mean if a little kid is there I'll yeah I'll do something very simple but I'm not the kind of person who um will just like I if I was somebody said draw a dinosaur flying a spaceship first thing I would do is go find a book about dinosaurs find a book about spaceships and see okay let's maybe I'll start drawing a spaceship based on some images and then I'll draw a dinosaur from flip through oh here's a good one I'll draw that dinosaur in the spaceship but just drawing something right out of my imagination there's certainly some people who can do that and can do a great job at it it's not something that's ever really interested in me, interested me at all. Like I, it's just, that's a, it's a different skill and some people develop that skill. Some people don't, but that doesn't mean you're an artist or not an artist or yeah, that, those are, I, I don't know where people get these ideas or because often people pass those ideas on to everybody else and they are just ridiculous. So don't let anybody tell you that there's one way to be an artist and not another way to be an artist. And if you're not doing it this way, then you're not a real artist. Pfft. Who cares? If you are if you are happy drawing things from magazines and books, that's great. If you're happy drawing things from life, that's great. If you're happy drawing things from your imagination, that's great. All of it's great. Doing anything creative is great. Certainly a lot better than starting wars or... Uh, you know, doing drugs and getting drunk and all the terrible robbing banks or whatever else you could be doing. Um, wow, there's so many. Uh, there's Paula's in the chat there. Mandy. Oh, I mentioned Mandy. Randy's there. Wow. Kathy's there. Great to see you. Um, yeah, Goodman says, uh, when you're drawing animation, you, you just, um, make the drawing look active and give personality to it. Yeah. So yeah, lots of great tips there in the chat. So, um, I'm a huge fan of, of Beatrix Potter. I think she's, um, I mean, she's certainly amongst the most successful artists of all time. No question about it, just if we just take the, the sales figures, but then the, the influence that she had on other um, artists, illustrators, especially children's book authors, I, I, I would even go so far as to say she is responsible for establishing the children's book industry as we know it today. Books that are specifically written for children in the voice of children and not um, because 
again, it's hard to even just imagine that the children's books before that were really for adults that might have... You could think about, like, if you are read any of the Brothers Grimm stories of which a lot of Disney movies are based on, like uh, Snow White, and, like, those are not really appropriate for children. Very scary, right? So she revolutionized the industry. She, she is also the first person to license their characters images for other things so one of the first things she did um, after the publication of the tales of peter rabbit was to create a um, to license those images to the creation of of small dolls for children that and she approved the the the, the fabric and the coloring and the way they were sewn together so she is not only the first person to license their their characters in for other media again because they made wallpaper posters board games tea sets or Peter Rabbit appeared on coins postage stamps I mean on and on I mean that's just that was originally while Beatrix Potter was alive never mind all the things that have happened over the past you know 60 years where you know it's there's comic books and stickers and video games and movie after movie TV shows ex all sorts of things right so um, how different the world would be had Beatrix Potter not lived I mean it's kind of I mean would toy stores that as we as we know them today would not exist right um, I mean, you could even go so far as to say our understanding of childhood and what a child is was 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 influenced quite strongly by Beatrix Potter, right? If you go, if you look at the literature and the history of childhood, which there, you know, it's relatively recently that we look at children as as being different than adults and that we give them this grace period to grow up because back in the day, you know, especially during the 1800s, little kids were sent into factories to work and all sorts of things. Anyway, she's a, a huge pioneer. And if, if you do have a chance, take a look at some of the, the illustrations she did of, of, um, flowers and mushrooms and small animals that have that weren't, didn't appear in her stories. So, um, let's move on. Okay. So, typically what we do, sometimes what we do next, is we do a little bit of underpainting here. Now, I might do something a little bit different that I don't normally do, which is... Instead of uh, painting, I'm going to just do a little bit of outlining with a pencil. I'm just doing this off the top of my head because I think I can kind of get away with it. Um, and because I want to try to paint this painting a little bit like a watercolor. So I'm just going to very gently go back over some of these lines. Just enough that I'll be able to see them as I start painting the background. Okay, so it's barely visible there. Even the shadow, I'm going to ignore that for right now. Now let's go to the next step. So next step, we want, let's put some color into the background. And as I said, I want to try to paint this 
a little bit like a watercolor painting. So here's one illustration, here's another one. This is the original sketch from that letter. But I like this. Maybe I do want to draw these um, bushes here very quickly. Okay, I think that's good enough. So let's paint that sky in. And... This will be interesting. I've, I've never used this, tried to do what I want to do today, which I think is what I'm going to do, is I'm going to use the satin glazing fluid to basically turn my paints into watercolors to give it a super transparent look. So, um, glazing fluid is I, this, I think you should have this in your in your um, your arsenal. We could do this with water. It's not going to be as effective. I mean, water works well, and I know some of you are going to use water, and I'd be really interested to see how how your results pan out. Um, but What I'm going to do here, actually, let's get more of this on. I'm going to get a lot of glazing fluid on my brush, just, just clear, right? That's going to dry totally clear. And let's put a little bit of blue. Now I want to kind of have a bit of a halo around the edge. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take another brush and just kind of soften my the edges a bit here. Okay, that's very subtle. Probably a little bit too subtle, but let's just keep on going. Now I'm going to take some yellow. So I'm mixing a green. Now that green might be just... Let's take a little bit. Uh, so I put a little bit of red in there, hoping to lighten that up so it's not quite so intense. Now, if you're doing this without glazing fluid, keep in mind that the paint will dry very quickly and your ability to kind of soften those edges is very limited because you have very short window of time before it dries up.
Let's, uh... I'm gonna go for... I'm gonna paint the foreground down here, even though it's a warm... Um, green. So I'm taking my warm yellow, a little bit of warm blue. So obviously, essentially what I'm doing is trying to simulate the look of watercolor with acrylic paint here. I'm not super happy with everything here, but, um, and I have to be careful once, because as this starts to dry, it's going to start peeling that paint off. So if I'm like, it's like, oh yeah, that's okay enough. Let's, I'm going to blow dry it. And then I'm, I might extend that corner out just a little bit. Okay. So I'll blow dry this. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to do a little bit, make this just a little bit more square down here. I'm just going to kind of darken it in a few places around Peter Rabbit here.
So on camera that looks very yellowy, but it's that's it's very kind of a light green, very grassy green. I'm happy with the way everything is developing so far. And says, thank you, Michael, so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Pascal and Goodman as well. Just remember that over the course of your creative journey, you're going to run into a lot of people who are going to tell you that there's one way to do things. And it just so happens to be that the right way to do it is the way that that person does it, right? And you don't have to listen to those people. You don't have to listen to what I have to say. I mean, I try to show lots of different approaches so that you can find one that works best for you, but but don't ever take anybody's word for anything. And I think that goes for more than just art. That goes for the news these days. Do your own research um, and you know, spend time looking at different art, find artists that you like, whose styles meet, you know, that are doing things that you want to do. I think the best thing is when you see something and you're like, oh man, I wish I did that. Oh, they're, they're doing exactly what I'm doing. Or they did exactly what I want to do. Oh man, that's not such a bad thing. Cause then it's like, okay, well, if I do something similar, then I know there's already interest in that. I'm not going out into the universe all by myself trying to reinvent the wheel. Somebody's already broken some of that ground for me and I can kind of fall in those footsteps. We know that the, you know, the world is big enough for whatever interest people have to find somebody out there who will like it, who will appreciate it, and chances are there's already someone who's already done something similar. Okay, I think I want to do a little bit more in the background before I move on here. Let's look at this again. Obviously, colors are much brighter. We're, we're going to work our way there. We're not quite there yet, but I think I might want to get some of this reddish quality into those far bushes. So how about let's take some cool red. Probably even going to take this brown so it's not quite so wild. Mix that in here. There's a lot of paint on there, so I'm just going to get some of the excess stuff. Because it makes it hard to blend things. Notice how as I go out here, my brush is going to get more and more, less and less of this red will come off.
So this, I think, is just tend to be a little shadow, you know, in the tree there, or the bushes in the background. I'm just using my finger just to get to, to blot out maybe some of the sharp lines that were there. I feel like maybe the, they work better when they're just a bit softer. Okay. How about let's take a little bit more Cool blue. And let's have a few of these. Let's see about the shadow under here. And the great thing with that is, you know, you see I just wiped that paint right away, right off. anything with the sky. I want to darken that. What if we put just a little bit of yellow over there? No, it's not in the original. But it might be nice to have just a little bit of variation in that sky. Again, I'm going to take just a little bit of glazing fluid. I'm going to take a little bit of cool yellow. Obviously, I could use a blending brush to soften that rather than my finger. Okay. And let's blow dry all.
And then I'm gonna put some more blue back into the sky. I wonder what happens. What's what happens here if I paint over top of that yellow? like what happened there is some of the yellow that was on my brush rubbed off when I was blending so let's just get rid of that that brush needs to be cleaned You know, the question to myself would be just like, well, how dark do I want to make these? We'll let that stand for right now. Let's take a little bit more blue. Okay, I, again, I know all these colors aren't exactly quote unquote correct, but this is so just, we're just getting started here. So I think let's move to the foreground here. Now that we've got the background started, let's paint Peter Rabbit himself 
in, or at least get him started, and then that way we'll have a clear idea of what needs to be done, if anything, in the background. Because my brain is just not big enough to be able to paint the background in and walk away and do the foreground and be totally done. I want to have some idea of what the colors are in the foreground before I, I, I sign off on my background. Okay, so if, what color, how do we want to paint the rabbit? You can see that she's, like, in some of these, very little color. I mean, there's just a little bit, like, here's the, the I guess, the, the paper, you'd say, uh, leaving the white for the tail, and then just little bits of brown and, and the jacket itself. Let's, um... Well, let's mix a warm brown. So we'll take our oops. we'll take our warm yellow, a little bit less warm red, and then even less warm blue. The the more blue we put in here, the darker of a brown we're gonna get. But considering how much I'm diluting these with um, a glazing medium, having one that's a little bit darker might work because it's otherwise we'd make for a very light color. We're just not even going to see it. I'm leaving a little bit of a halo around the, the edge here. Now, you see, just like in the way watercolor works, when I overlap two semi-transparent colors over top of one another, they create a darker color together. Now we are going to outline everything, so that is also going to help clean up any kind of untidiness if you feel like, like, ah, it looks like garbage right now. Well, we'll clean it all up 
Make it look all pretty. Have no fear. Let's, uh, let's paint his jacket next. Now, she's used a kind of a cooler blue. I'm going to use cool and warm blue to create basically a cobalt blue which is a blue that exists in between my warm and cool colors I'm just going to take a brush and go over this to soften out those brush strokes. Again, a lot of people probably watching are going to use um, water to do much of this. You could use watercolor to do this, but if you're trying to do this with uh, um, acrylic paint, I think you're going to find it's just it's going to cause you some like water and acrylic paint trying to do this. It might be a little bit difficult. Okay, let's back that out now. Now that we've got some of those colors, right now it starts to see seem start you know coming together as a as a piece I mean, that looks great right now. Like, in fact, if I just, I could at this exact moment call it a day, do or not, well, I would out, do a little bit of outlining with black paint and I'd be done and I think it would look great. I think I do want to make the grass look a little bit less yellow and make it a little bit more on the greenish side, but that's no problem. I mean, I could, uh, yeah, I want to do some detailing in the fur, but. I mean, it might not look great right now, but black outlines would change that instantly. So let's blow dry this, and then we'll... we'll... So, let's do more detail on the rabbit, though, before we go. So, um, I'm going to use a smaller brush. And, you know, and I was going to say I might mix a different color, 
But I could just use this same color that I painted with previously to do little details. So let's zoom back in. Okay, and maybe let's start down on his bottom, <laughs> because if we make a mistake, I'd much rather it to be down here where no one will really be looking as carefully, rather than right on his face or his ears, etc. Okay, so what I want to do is... little hairs Right, I think it looks pretty good. Again, it looks very yellowy. Doesn't surprise me. Part of that also, frankly, is as ridiculous as it sounds, that's part of the imprematura kind of bleeding through that is influencing how yellow that ultimately appears. We're going to get more brown and red in here. You know, there's a little bit of overlap with that blue from the sky on Peter's ears here. Not a big deal. I mean, not a big deal to me. I know some, you know, every watercolor painter also is a little bit different. Like some people are, get very worked up by stuff like that. Okay, that's good. Um, I'll blow dry that, and then I think I'm going to go for a little bit more of a brownish red in here. Um, I'll probably do three, maybe four slightly ver different variations of this fur here. I'm just going to blow dry that. Goodman says, I have an opinion that oil painting looks 
more beautiful than watercolor painting. You're certainly welcome to your opinion, for sure. I mean, I think maybe you'd get some disagreement. Um, some people, they're... You know, I mean, I... I, I think watercolor painting is incredible. If you can do watercolor painting really well, then you're like a, a god to me. Watercolor painting is is very difficult. I'm probably scaring people off watercolor painting. I'm sure there's some people who are like, really? I don't think it's that difficult. But in the same way, I don't know. Uh, like growing up, I had a bunch of friends who were really good at skateboarding. I always wanted to skateboard. I could never really do it very well. And some people, it's so easy. You just sort of lean in and I'd try it and I'd fall on my face and I'd break bones. Um, for some people, it's really easy. For some people, it's not. Um, you may find watercolor paintings are the, the thing that you were born to do. You may find oil paintings or acrylic painting or tempera painting or gouache painting or digital painting would be your thing that's why you should try them all And there's Tanya says, I always love the Peter Rabbit art. Yeah, there's such an iconic part of, I think, a lot of people's childhood these days that... Uh, brings back vivid memories for a lot of us. For me, it's like, it's the little books that I always thought, I always just loved. Like, the little book that you could put in your bag and carry with you anywhere. You know, like, um, most of the books that my parents had when I was growing up, you know, like, their books were much bigger and they are heavier and, you know, like... Whereas this, it felt like a book that was made just for me. It was like my size. It belonged to me. I really liked that. 
Let's do another brown, but this one's going to have more blue in it. Maybe I'm just going to blow dry that real quick. little bit dark.
I think that's pretty good. Uh, let's go back. Well, let me do... Actually, I'm just going to do a little bit more in his jacket, actually, before I move on. <laughs> Barbara says, it's 2.20 in the morning here in the UK. I just woke up and tuned in to see how it's going. Good to see you, Barbara. Yeah, and I won't forget about the little red slippers, Tanya. That's a good idea. Good. Thank you for the reminder. Uh, so, this jacket... I'm going to put a bit more cool blue in there. This is very warm so far. And I think I just want to make it a bit cooler. Soften up. Those brush strokes, because I'm going for that watercolor look. You can see just that little bit of paint came off on the edge. That brush there. I'm going to put a bit more warm blue. In a few places. I'll blow dry that and do that again.
smaller brush for finer blending here. Okay, I like that. Um, yeah, let's see. I'm going to take this same color. Okay, let's actually blow dry that first. So using this kind of little bit of a cool red, just so I can just do little spots of it and it'll darken some of that brown a bit.
This is really starting to look like a watercolor here, which is perfect, right? Let's make a bit of a, a brown back there. Like, it can't hurt to have little areas of, of color that are just in a variety in everywhere. And all that just gets brought out with, through subsequent layers of paint, so... I guess I'm just thinking to myself how much more do I need to do let's go to the background again like yeah let's do that next so I'm getting pretty close to being done it's just a matter of how much more I really want to do. I mean, I, I could have stopped 20 minutes ago. I could stop now. I could paint for another four hours. Um, how much better would it be in four hours is the question. Not much better. But I do want to... Well, let's, let's take a look again. Let's see what these look like side by side. Okay, so I, I'm using the patterning from this version um, of the of the Peter Rabbit that um, Beatrix Potter did here. And then I'm kind of mixing it in with this background. So I think let's get the this grass needs to be greener, hey? It's a little bit yellow. So we could let's uh let's make it let's make it a bit more of a combination of warmer green. So let's take our warm yellow and warm blue. And then let's take some cool blue and bring that in here. Get much more electric green. Now that's pretty intense, obviously, and so we're gonna mute it down significantly. In fact. Um, let's just wipe off all that.
better. Yeah, that's for sure. I think I might be happy with the sky at that level of darkness. So that's helpful. So I was saying that, uh, before I started using the hairdryer there, that determining that I'm happy with the sky, that's, that's important. You know, deciding what you don't need to do any more of is sometimes just as important as to figure out what you still need to do. I have to be careful about darkening these trees too much because if I darken them a lot then I'm gonna have to darken the rabbit Peter Rabbit more to kind of balance it okay I think I'm gonna blow dry
Okay, I'm getting there. I'm feeling it. I want to darken that ground even more. The color of that original one, I've, I've definitely deviated from it. I mean, I guess this is fairly close to the original, but I certainly didn't make the sky nearly as dark. Hmm. What if we take warm blue, warm yellow, Hmm. Now that it is getting darker, I do now start to wonder maybe I should darken my sky. That it looks a little bit um, empty up there. So, that's okay. Let's... Um,
Let's get there. Kathy says, looking really good. I love it. Gotta go see you next time. And there's Philippe says, hello. Hello, Philippe. That feels good, but you can see I'm not happy. Should, yeah, I'm going to do that again. Um, and rather than start fiddling with that, I want to blow dry it. Well, let's blow dry it and see. Maybe I will be happy with that. I don't know. It's kind of growing on me.
Ah, oops, sorry, I was muted there. <laughs> Heidi says, let's do this one, Tanya. Tanya says, challenge accepted. Good. Well, I think all of that worked. I, essentially, the next step would be to do the, the black outline. So I'm just thinking to myself, is there enough contrast here? between the foreground and background or do I have do I want to amplify that I mean sometimes I would do sometimes I want to make it more subtle um, Maybe want to make that even darker. So I'm just taking a bit of this warm green. a little bit more cool blue What should I do here? Maybe, I know she used a little bit of blue there, but what if we go back to red and brown? All this is quite sticky on the surface here too. I think that's what I needed. A little bit of brown in that grass. Okay, I think that's probably good enough. I think I'm happy with all of that. Okay, so now we're just gonna do outlines, I think. Now I don't wanna speak too soon because it is possible <laughs> that I might wanna do some finishing touches after I get those lines in there. And there's Nikki says, hello. Heidi says, Michael, your rabbit looks great. Barbara says, Hi Goodman, hi Kathy, hi Tanya. I need to watch the first part of the stream. This one looks different from the other paintings. A little bit different. We're um, sort of approaching this a little bit more like a watercolor painting. And 
once again using a technique I don't usually use for acrylic painting but since almost all of Beatrix Potter's artworks are watercolor it seems like it makes some sense to try to rather I mean we could do this in watercolor but I'm certainly not an expert in watercolor but I feel like we could kind of simulate a little bit of that here Just thinking to myself, do I want to make more of a separation here, or do I want to paint that with a line? I think, honestly, I think what I'm doing is overthinking it, and I won't know until I do it. So there's no point in just like, hmm, I don't know, is it going to be good? I don't know. Randy says, good night, everyone. It's bedtime in Illinois. <laughs> Sounds good. Have a great night, Randy. So let's get... Um, okay, so what I want to do now is I want to paint some outlines on the rabbit itself. And that's going to tell us a lot of stuff. Right now, it's it's a little bit hard to to see how successful these last few layers have been because without those, the outlines are going to change everything radically. And we could use a Posca pen for this. We could use a paintbrush. I think I'm going to use a paintbrush because I've used Posca pen many many times, and that would make sense. But I think she used. Um, a paintbrush when she was originally doing these in ink so I feel like that conceptually makes some sense so let's bring up okay so first thing first is to mix a black paint so to mix our black where should we let's do this right here we'll take our cool blue and our cool yellow and our warm red and we'll mix these together black again it's not gonna be a perfect black but it's gonna be pretty close we could always use black right from the tube if we really wanted but I think this is gonna do exactly what we needed to do may add a little bit of <clears throat> glazing fluid, or I am, not may, but I am, just to give this paint just a little bit more fluidity because it's been sitting on the palette for the past couple of hours here. Okay, I got a nice sharp paintbrush. Maybe let's, I always kind of like starting somewhere else. Oh, I forgot the red of the slippers. Oof, that was close. Tanya would have been, would have noticed that. Let's get a little bit of that red on here. Maybe 
Maybe that's a little bit too intensely red. Ah, not on camera. Okay, I'm just going to quickly blow dry that so that it just doesn't get all over my hand. Now let's do our black outlines. Okay. How does everybody else?
Barbara says, I'm signing off now. It's 3 a.m. Looking great so far. Thanks for helping us become better artists. Thanks so much, Barbara, for saying so. I appreciate that. Hmm, she's got the fur going. I'm going to keep it. Let's get some of this furry paws. Ah, it wasn't on camera, darn it. So, uh, if it's not clear, one of the things that I'm trying to do here is create a difference between the way that I paint the jacket or the coat versus the fur and one having very solid lines versus having these kind of furry broken lines.
Okay, so notice that there's this... I accidentally painted blue right up there, and it's going beyond the pencil line there. So I did a bad job of painting inside the lines. Is that a disaster? No, I'm going to make it work because now it's going to look like there's the kind of a bit of that light coming through the, the loose hairs there. Hmm, I'm not sure I like that. Okay, let's just take a look side by side, see how things turn.
So, because I put a little bit of glazing fluid into the black, it made it a little bit transparent. And in some places, actually, I, I, I prefer it. I like it a little bit like that. It's sort of, it's like a, a mid-value, not quite as dark. But in some places, it feels... Like it needs just a little punch of extra dark. If I was doing a lot of outlining like this, I'd want to really seriously consider using fluid acrylics or acrylic inks. As opposed to always just taking soft body or, or heavy body acrylic and thinning it with mediums. Much more. What do I want to do here? She does have little shadows under the elbows and, and the collar. I'm just debating whether I need those. There's some other wrinkles. Those, to me, on my picture, seem kind of a little bit superfluous, so I might just leave those out. I guess just whiskers, is that? Okay. 
just a couple of tiny things left to do, and then I think we're done for the day. So I think really what I want to do last here is those whiskers, and we'll be ready to, to say goodbye for the day. So there's the original. There's mine. Let's... Um, You can see how that black transforms everything immediately. It has a profound impact on the whole painting, right? Um, let's just mix a bit of this brown again. I'm going to make it, well, maybe a little bit darker than the previous brown, just so it shows up nicely. Not too subtle. Because remember, I'm going to put a little bit of uh, medium in here just to help brush that on. Those whiskers. I'm almost tempted to. So do I want to try to cover up that little spot, or will that draw attention to it? Well, let's blow dry that real quick. Go How does that one cross? Over the mouth there? Where should that go? Mm, I'm not sure that was the right location.
be? Do I want another wrinkle under his arm? Oh, I might now just put one little drop of white. On that eye. So I take some white paint. that just get a little bit more black for the nose Oh, the signature. Her signature. Was, that's okay. Hmm. I'm going to use this paintbrush for black, but I want it to be nice and, and fresh and clean. So, oh, uh, and Goodman says, I like the music. Let me just share with you. Music. So what you're hearing is uh, music by Skim Milk. This is my good friend Sam Davidson, and I've done all well most of the album artwork for his various different albums over the years, including designing his logo. And there's a picture of Sam, good friend of mine. So he did all the music that you hear in the background. The link for this is in the description below, but I'll put it in the chat there. So you can find it easily. And if you like the music, you can buy the whole album for just two bucks. That would be a great way to support an artist like myself, but who makes music. <laughs> um, I do want to see if I can get rid of these little pencil lines here. Just... Get rid of that a little bit. Same thing on the other side. Not a big deal if they show through. It didn't. It do, doesn't bother me except that they are like I don't mind if there's pencil lines in here. It's just that I kind of want that nice halo of. Um, light around the outside edges okay let's um get her signature in here
Okay, the question is, where should that signature go? How close to that corner do I want it to be? And how much do I want it to overlap? I think if it overlaps a little bit of on that green, I think it's going to be okay. Okay, so I want to be very careful not to press too hard with anything other than my pen here. Now there was a little bit of carbon that transferred on to the canvas. Just wipe that away. Now the question is, what color should I put there? Black is fine. Brown is fine. Um, I think I like this color that's there. This kind of teal. Take a little bit of black and put that in there. This, by the way, is excellent practice for brushwork. I mean, obviously we could just use a Posca pen.
Goodman says medium brown would be good for the type. Well, I did think of that. It would have been a little bit more subtle. <laughs> this is like getting hit over the head with a sledgehammer. But the fact that um, you 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 made that connection to the brown for the signature is a great sign, Goodman. That's because you know if we asked a hundred different people what color they should they would put there, you'd get a lot of people would say black, a lot of people would say blue, maybe red like the shoes, brown like you said. Maybe this uh, green that I've used here, this kind of teal green. I think that's good. So, let's... So we made it to the end of the episode. Now let's take a look at how these paintings or artworks fared side by side and um, how we might feel about them and if this is something you want to do yourself. So if you've been watching throughout the whole episode, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Do it right now. That's a huge help to a YouTuber like myself. Take a photograph of the painting you created and upload it to our Facebook group. And if you haven't joined the Facebook group, please do that. That's once a month. I go through everything that people post on the Facebook group and give free feedback here on YouTube. So if you want to participate in that, that would make me very happy because it makes me really happy to see people doing creative things with their lives. You can use PayPal, Super Chat, send an e-transfer via my email or send a check in the mail by contacting me through my email. All of those links are down in the description below. My email's on my website and on the Facebook group. Um, PayPal, that's where most of your donations come through, and I'm super grateful for your support over the years. Those of you that have been uh, sometimes just a dollar or two here and there, you know, if all thousand or so people who will end up watching this video the next few weeks gave a dollar, that would be huge, right? So... Um, let's take a look at how these paintings fared. Now we've got, again, a few different examples. Which one we want to compare it to is the question. Oh, let's side by side. There's one of them. There's a different one. There's the, the original. There's the one I was basing the, the background colors on. Hmm. Hard to say which, I mean, again, mine is a composite of a number of different images here. Uh, so I've sort of taken bits of each of them. For the most part, Peter Rabbit is based on this image. You can see this one, she painted a little bit differently, added a little bit more. And this one is radically different. In fact, I would be surprised if she even touched this image. I think, you know, the background, everything, it just looks so different than the others that I feel like maybe it was 
uh, copied and, by a different artist for a different pub, type of publication for some whatever reason. Um, but uh, I'm happy with the way this one turned out. Obviously, it took a little bit of time. There's a lot of very thin um, glazes that I put of different color, which is very similar to working with watercolor. So if you've never painted with acrylic paint, but you've done a lot of watercolor painting, you might really enjoy using like a glazing fluid to mix into your acrylic paints to get them this thin so that they start to behave like watercolors. Uh, let's take a look. Let's zoom in here. Um, so you can also see the way that I painted the fur is is a little bit different than the way she did. She did sort of a little dotted line. And she actually was drawing on a smaller surface than what I was doing. So because I had an extra little bit of room, I'm like, you know what, let's make it a little bit more furry. To really make a distinction between the jacket, which has these solid lines, versus these broken furry lines here. Let's just look. Now this one again is much different, but I also included that shadow down there, and I kind of abstracted that shadow a bit as well. So let's go up. Yeah, I mean, if anything, maybe I, my jacket is a little bit too smooth. And it kind of looks, mine looks a little bit more like pajamas rather than a coat. I could, you can tell me what you think. Um, it's almost like, like maybe there should be a little bit more nuance in here. But it's okay. It doesn't have to be the same. I did kind of struggle a little bit with how to do those the whiskers. Uh, it's okay like that though, but um, and I mean the whole face looks so different than any kind of cartoon character people normally draw here. It looks more like a rabbit than really any other children's character I can think of. And let's just, oops, let's look at the color in the background there. I'm happy with the way that the background sort of just fades out on the ends and creates that uh, vignette effect. I think that turned out pretty well. Uh, the, uh, this version that she did, or maybe I, th I really think somebody else did here that we're looking at on the left, uh, doesn't have that feature. I was sort of using this one as kind of inspiration. And also how a lot of the illustrations she did for, for not just Peter Rabbit, but for a lot of hers, kind of have that um, soft edge around the, the outside there. Okay. There we go. There's another one down. Okay, folks, well, thank you so much for tuning in and painting along with me once again. I hope you all have a wonderful evening or morning, sleep, wherever you happen to be on our beautiful planet. 
We'll see you next week. We might do one on Sunday, though. So, uh, again, hit that notification button so you know when those are happening. See you guys. Have a great night. And good painting to you all. <laughs> that was a good one. I like that one.